But Jack, it was your grandmother's stroke that brought you back to Australia. That's right. She was in a sad and sorry state. She was in the hospital and very battered and bruised and swollen. But um, when I got back, because Byron had told me at the airport, don't come back, you're too much trouble. And he'd already taken a second wife. My friend took me aside and I was trying to breastfeed a new, you know, a two month old baby and look after my toddler. And he said to me, do you really want your children to see you battered and treated in this way every day of their lives? And I thought, no. So I decided to stay and see if I could stay in Australia. From time to time, Byron would come to Australia and see the children. Yes, look, he, there was never a custody fight in Australia. That's a misnomer in the general public's thoughts and the and tabloid media. He signed over custody of the children to me, offered it to me, not forced to, he offered in the Australian courts, and I gratefully accepted it. What happened in the next seven years in a very brief way? We made a life for ourselves. I, I started, I went from palace to pension and then I waitressed and then I typed and then I, um, I started working in PR and I worked, at, I worked at Channel 9 for a little while, um, always juggling around my children. And they grew up. There was mud pies and baths in the, you know, outdoors and Vegemite sandwiches and climbing trees and hanging out. And all the time I was learning to be a better mum and find confidence in myself until about uh, five years after my divorce from the Prince, I remarried. It was brilliant. Did you foresee any threat to the children at that time? Always, because he had political aspirations. I, I, he, he tried to position himself from the image of playboy prince and nightclubber and, and polygamous man, as he was known in Malaysia, to Islamic stalwart who could stand for political office. He'd stood up in court and said that it was his Islamic jihad to retrieve his eldest son from the infidel country of Australia. It was the news the Gillespies had feared. They were told late last night their children had been taken illegally out of Australia. I'd been home in Australia for seven years and the kids were happy, being normal Aussie kids. And Byron had unlimited access because I really encouraged it. I'd say goodbye to the children at the front door and that was the last time I saw them for 14 years. I had to fight for my children. I saw it as my job to keep the children's images out there. And the, stra the strain was enormous. As time went on, first off you want to have your children back, then you want to have contact with them on the phone and then at least you want news of them. But at the same time you want to make sure that they know that you didn't give them up. One year I even uh, got a Star Trek video for Eden and in the middle of that cut into that and put in a section of me. I love you both very, 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 very much and I've tried to get you back and I can't. I never got to them. I figured that the only way I could maintain any sense of power and garner more knowledge was to research child abduction. And that led to me making a documentary called Empty Arms, Broken Hearts, following cases all around the world. But the one thing that came out of all the interviews that I've done is that the children come home eventually, whenever they can. As a direct result of the film, I set up the Empty Arms Network, which I financed from my own money and the support of Justice Nicholson, the head of the Family Court of Australia. I learned how to laterally pursue a case. I've been involved in the repatriation of 69 children altogether. I wrote my very first book, Once I Was a Princess, in 1995, and the book opened a lot of doors for me. Justice Nicholson asked me if I would come and speak at an international conference on child abduction, and I will be forever grateful because he gave me a purpose that was channeled professionally. Jack, what was it that made you wake up one morning and decide that you were going to work for getting other children back to their parents that had been separated? Because no matter how much I wanted to stay under the doona, people kept coming up to me and asking me for help. I had become someone that other left behind parents understood to have a public voice. It just seemed immoral not to use that knowing that I could. To what extent did the kidnapping of the children bring back all the old problems you faced in childhood yourself? I'm not quite sure. 
Well, I don't know how I allowed, I don't know what I allowed to creep back in sometimes, I'm not quite sure. I mean, the issues around were you worthwhile, were you lovable? Did you have okay self esteem? Were you being judged? Being judged was a horrendous thing. I, I, I would sit in, on the bad days, particularly in the middle of the media maelstrom, and sit in a dirty bathrobe, having not eaten, having had chronic diarrhoea the night before, and just dry retching, and look like absolute crap, and be told by my media advisors that Australia doesn't like an ugly woman, they'll feel more sympathy for you if you put your lippy on. Go and put some lipstick on. And I'd be looking in the mirror and knowing that Australia was going to judge me and their judgment would affect whether or not they supported my children, not me, but whether or not they understood and supported that my children were Australian, they had Australian birth certificates, and that they deserved to be treated as Australian children who had been taken from our country. This happened to Lindy Chamberlain, and it happened to Joanne Lees in a way, that, that through the media there is judging of women particularly. Absolutely. Lindy, Lindy Chamberlain rang me. We had a really long conversation. She was fantastic. She said, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Just keep fighting. And that, that stuck with me. In the midst of all of this, a trip to Africa was about to change the way you saw the world. Absolutely. <laughs> Bill Searle, my friend, who was the EP of Neighbours, asked me to be General Dog's body on the shoot in Kenya. We were filming in a Maasai village. And then one day, a warrior came up to me called Mongo. Would you like to see my school? They had written and drawn in the dirt, and they'd never seen a book before. So I decided to launch Operation Book Power. All the publishers came to the party, and then I went to South African Airways and I asked for a jumbo jet. So in two years' time, the, the growth of Operation Book Power went from $25,000 to $2.1 million worth of books. And that in turn led me to Bosnia to rebuild schools and to work with pedagogues on healing children through fantasy and fiction. And I started working with a mine action group there. And I dealt a lot with refugee women. And that then inspired me to start Operation Angel to airlift feminine hygiene products and soap and shampoo to women in the Balkans. And that coincided with the beginning of the Kosovo conflict as well. And at that time I was appointed Special Ambassador to Care International. And it was the most worthwhile thing I have ever done in my life. And then the horrific, horrific, horrific time in East Timor. The Timorese experience for me was probably the hardest aid experience. After Timor, I set up a new life for a while in Sydney and I had a baby daughter. And Verity and I moved home to, to Melbourne in 2001. And I rented a little house and met the boy next door. Exactly like you. And then ended up marrying the boy next door. Actually, I think he fell in love with Verity first, and we were really blessed by having a second child. Lysander was born in 2003. Christmas 2002, I received an email from Shahira, out of the blue. She had found me through the internet, and we started a clandestine correspondence between myself and Shah and Eden for almost three years. 